everything we need right here. Yeah. I know. We are not. Uh, uh, and so this is Senate Health and Welfare. We're back. And we have with us uh, Representative Boyton. I do you know everyone around the table. Uh, um, no. Senior so right. Yeah. What's up? Here, we're going to introduce ourselves. Oh, <laughs> Senator Martine LaRock, you look shouldn't in Central. I live in Burlington. Nice to see you. Thank you. Dave Wheat said I'm in Proctor and I serve Vermont. I mean, I was a. Well, we can. It's almost there. It's a whole Every day. It's only about 10 45. Jenny Lines and Chittenden Southeast, all of the rain towns, butting up to Cambridge. Yeah, we're just acting out. Gary Williams, representing the Rockland District of Baltimore. Hey, Lucy, you know me. Ruth Party, Addison District. So thank you for being here. Um, why don't you introduce yourself for the record? And we're just we're looking for an understanding of the importance of this bill. Go for it. Yeah, uh, I'm Representative Lucy Boyden. I represent Cambridge and Waterville, which is uh, District One Hundred and Three. Um, and I sit in the House Committee of Government Operations and Military Affairs. Um, so H six twenty two relating to emergency medical services mainly looks to equip the EMS advisory committee to evaluate the current state of the EMS system, expand training opportunities, and update the circumstances under which ambulance service providers are reimbursed for delivering services to Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, and just to give you a lay of the land, um, not only has H six twenty two had a journey of um, policy and language, but it also started in the House Health Care Committee. Um, and there was a joint hearing between the House Health Care Committee and um, House Government Operations and Military Affairs. We can. Yeah. And then it was um, uh, committed to House uh, Government Operations and Military Affairs, which then once passed out of committee, it went to Wake Unions and also House Appropriations. Took a long trip. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like many does. Yeah. So give us the big picture. Yeah. So. We looked at um, an effective EMS system, which includes um, timely and robust 911 response, uh, large incidence response, and medical transportation for definitive um, care for patients. And we heard a lot of testimony that described Vermont's EMS system as a patchwork. So across the state, EMS crews range from full time to part time to volunteer. Some volunteers pay for their own training out of pocket, some are awarded grants. And our funding system is a little yeah. um, which causes volunteer retention issues and gaps in services or overlapping service areas. Um, as you all know, EMS is a critical part of healthcare and a key service within communities across the state. So we really looked at H622 as one of the many steps forward in investing in our EMS um, providers and their training and just overall best practices. Um, and the bill has adjusted in many ways that brought stakeholders together um, in support, and it was unanimous, unanimously supported out of the House Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee, um, as well as on the floor. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. So I'm happy to do kind of a high-level walkthrough um, of the bill, or just talk about some sections that um, we took more testimony on, or I can save that for um, that council as well. you it's between you and Jen. So it's up to you too. How would that work for you, Jen? Well, I'm not going to do the high level. You want me to do the high level? Yeah, let, let, let's have Jen do it. You stay right here. Yeah, absolutely. Because we may have, we'll have some questions as we go through that. Yeah, great. That sounds great. Thank you. Appreciate it. We're just using Jen's time. When we, yeah, uh, I you think know she's wanted in and has different operations as well. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, so they just switched the. Okay. We're not letting either one of you go. <laughs> Good morning. Jen Harvey from the Office of Legislative Council, joining the Zoom. And we also have Drew Hazelton um, up online, and he'll be up at 11 or when, when you have to go through the grades. <laughs> So this is H622. Uh, it starts out, so this is an act related to emergency medical services. It starts out by amending the existing statute, setting out the policy and the EMS factor in Title 18, and it has purpose in some findings. The 
high levels, but too high level. Um, section two makes uh, some changes in the emergency medical services special fund, which is an existing special fund that gets revenues uh, received from the fire safety special fund, which you'll see some amendments to later. Um, but this adds language. This is a lot of this is about money for um, training of emergency medical service personnel and delivery of emergency medical services and ambulance services in Vermont. Um, and so it directs the commissioner to prioritize using the funds to provide grants to programs offering basic emergency medical services training at low cost or no cost to participants. So trying to expand the EMS workforce. Um, some additional language about making efforts to award grants with some geographic equity and uh, helping EMS districts that have not been historically successful receiving grants from the fund. Section three is a Medicaid provision that directs, uh, this is around transportation, uh, treatment without transportation. So emergency medical services delivered to a Medicaid beneficiary who is not transported to a different location during the period of the emergency. Um, Medicaid has fairly recently started to cover that uh, treatment without transport, but at a lower rate than the Medicare basic life support rate. So this would direct the reimbursement for that treatment without transport for Medicaid to be in an amount equal to the Medicare basic life support rate, and would also direct the Agency of Human Services to report uh, as part of its budget presentation um, annually, what it would cost to bring all reimbursement for Medicaid emergency medical services delivered to Medicaid beneficiaries up to the Medicare basic life support rate. But for now, just doing it for that treatment without transport. And Section 4 is kind of a conforming change adding to the existing statute on reimbursement for ambulance service providers to say for Medicaid, look to that other section. Uh, section five is on the EMS advisory committee um, and it makes some revisions. Some of them are just sort of cleanup and housekeeping changes. Um, but further in here, it specifies that the committee has administrative, technical, and legal assistance from the Agency of Human Services. And then it really overhauls the annual report. There's an annual report requirement in statute for the EMS advisory committee report to um, a number of committees, including this committee, about uh, things having to do with the emergency medical services system. They've been reporting the same information for many years. Um, so some of the testimony received in the House was that it didn't feel useful to be reporting the same information annually. So this would remove that reporting requirement and instead direct the EMS Advisory Committee to develop and maintain a five-year statewide plan for the coordinated delivery of emergency medical services in Vermont, and to update that annually with some goals, um, time frame for achieving those cost and funding data and performance standards for evaluating them. And so that report is due annually by December 15th um, with uh, uh, progress toward achieving the five-year goals. So update the five-year goal and report on progress toward achieving the goals. Sorry, five-year plan. Um, in addition, Section 6 directs the EMS Advisory Committee to do two things, uh, collect data necessary for a complete inventory and assessment of the EMS services currently available in Vermont, some information about um, workforce and spending and gaps, gaps and overlaps in services, um, and then also provide recommendations for the design of a statewide EMS system and it specifies a number of things that those recommendations relate to around uh, yes, EMS district structure and authority, workforce training standards and staffing best practices, resource allocation plan, process for annually reviewing EMS provider budgets, a governance model, cost estimates, um, facilitation and coordination of training, and then anything else they think is appropriate. Uh, directs the advisory committee to facilitate stakeholder con conversations um, so that they can get some input from others, not just the committee members themselves, um, and allows them to hire a project manager and consultants to help the committee in its work, gives them assistance from the Department of Health on this, and then has, um, by December 15th of 2025, the committee would submit its inventory and assessment 
um, that first piece of the work, and then a year later, they would submit design recommendations. Section seven, and Nolan will probably talk to you about this in more detail as well, but makes some, uh, some changes in the um, Vermont Fire Service Training Council uh, funding, which goes into the, the Fire Safety Special Fund. And currently that fund receives $1.2 million. This would increase that by 300,000 and then dedicate that 300,000, as you'll see on the next page, to increasing the allotment for the Emergency Medical Services Special Fund. This is um, this assessment is imposed on health insurance, or it's not, so just health insurance, insurance companies um, writing property and casualty insurance in this state. So it's an existing mm -hmm. uh, existing assessment, but it's increasing, the bill is increasing it by 300,000 and directing that 300,000 to the EMS Special Fund for training uh, and service delivery. And then you'll see in section eight, uh, 74,000 in global commitment funds goes to DIVA, uh, to DIVA in FY25 for the treatment without transport rate increase and breaks that out by the, the federal and general funds. Um, so it is just $31,206 is the general fund appropriation. Section nine, uh, allocates funding from that increase to the emergency medical services special fund that of that three hundred thousand dollar increase for FY twenty five one hundred and fifty thousand would go to the EMS advisory committee to uh, do its work that's set out in the bill and then if there is additional funding left in the emergency medical services special fund up to an additional two hundred and twenty thousand would be made available to the health department to support the work for a total of not more than 370,000, which was the original amount appropriated. And then um, some work was done to, to lessen the, or, or to uh, eliminate the effect of that on the general fund. Section 10 finally says it will take effect on passage, except the two appropriation pieces take effect on July 1st. So, and no one has a fiscal note for us. No fiscal note. Um, want to ask any. questions for Jack. There's a lot of money in here and a lot and it's in the money in here and there's yes and it's in the budget policy stuff policy stuff, policy stuff that we need to right. just, you may want to use the reporter about it. yes um you were gov ops so the medicaid right well, medicaid was medicaid was health care recommendation from health care to yeah. ops so in terms of the appropriations in the other sections of the bill i'm sure that both committees worked collaboratively on the appropriations. The study that's being done will determine the services needed. Do does does any of the do any of the appropriations sort of look forward to what can I say funding services that the study is also looking at? How do they no? I mean, the money is being appropriated in FY25, so it's only... Oh, it's 25. Right. And that's, uh, uh, the okay. increased amount going into the Emergency Medical Services Special Fund would be ongoing, would be a base yeah. funding. There would be more funding going to that fund from the assessment that would be used okay. for the purposes set forth in the statute, unless you did something different. So, Representative Boyd, and then we'll uh, send her already asked for questions. Right? Yeah, and one thing I would just say about the fund is that it hasn't been updated since it was created in 2011. So um, we heard a lot of testimony from the committee that explained that the funds were, the current amount of funds right now uh, were insufficient to keep up with the needs of training. You know, there's been a lot of turnover um, and just a lot of gaps. But we did we did hear a lot. We have heard a lot about these efforts. Okay. Senator Hardy, you have a question? Uh, no, I just wanted to note that in uh, the big flood recovery or government response to flooding bill that the government, uh, that Senate GovOps did, S310, included in that is also an increase in the that uh, insurance assessment and the amount for training for EMS, uh, we we up we doubled it, so it was up to a hundred an additional one hundred fifty thousand, so a total of three hundred thousand. They 
tripled it. So mm -hmm. they went up to 450,000. I don't know what the right number is. We got didn't get, uh, in, we got inconclusive testimony from them about how much they needed. So we picked a number. Um, so I, I, it could be that 450 is better number. I, we asked multiple times and didn't get a solid answer from them. Did you want to comment? Sure, yeah. We originally had 370,000 in general funds appropriated to the EMS Advisory Committee mm -hmm. for the purpose of hiring a project manager and um, I think one or two consultants. Um, and that was uh, that number was suggested by the EMS Advisory Committee to us. Um, and instead of using general funds, we then incorporated it into what you'll see in section seven, where um, 150,000 is, 150, is allocated towards training, and then the rest can be used oh. for us, uh, um, hiring of a project manager. Okay, or uh, I didn't see, I didn't catch that. So it's, yeah, so the training amount is actually the equivalent to what is in 310 or less. Oh, I can get into that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll just we'll want to make sure they like, all match hey, us through. By the time we go, yes, things are passed. So exactly. Yeah. Senator Hula. may I ask a question of my colleague from GovOps? I sure. Oh, thank you. Um, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I last session we did a lot of work on EMS and took some deep dives. I'm just wondering if you worked on this bill at all, or was consulted. Oh, here, this is the way it goes. Okay. Traditionally, EMS has been in this committee, right? And a few years ago, uh. GovOps got very interested, and GovOps has a very significant role to play with this. So the bill that was written in-house started in health and health care, okay. and there's significant health care stuff here. And then the bill went to GovOps. When it came over here, it landed here first. Its next drive will be down the hall to GovOps. And because we don't meet at the same, we don't both meet in the morning or the afternoon, right. we can't have joint hearings, okay. meetings, not hearings, but meetings. So if we did meet in the afternoon, we would then. So my only point is it seems like there's a lot in this bill, and I'm going to rely on my, some of my colleagues yeah. more expertise to help me. I'll be happy. So, and I don't expect, just from my perspective on this and having worked in this area before, it, uh, for me, it, it makes sense for us to move through our sections and our our understanding and add whatever we need to add fairly quickly and then allow for GovOps to look at some organizational structure and the systems analysis stuff. So we're, and then, of course, appropriations will be putting it all together with money. Thank you. So, question, Senator Williams, Senator Weeks. So I just had a simple question. The project manager, what, what project are they intending to manage? What they, aspect? Yeah, um, they would be assisting with um, the development of the committee's five-year plan. Um, and so we heard a lot of testimony about how, because our system is very much a patchwork across the state, um, Talk about communications? No, our, our EMS system. Um, so many, many um, EMS groups have different ways of collecting information and data. They have different levels of capacity, similar to um, our municipals, uh, municipalities. Excuse me. Um, so they felt the need for, and we agreed for the need for a project manager and consultant to ensure that they get uh, reliable data and, and effectively can do their work to assist with the development of this five-year plan. Right, um, largely in the section on the uh, recommendations for the statewide system. The fund, the fund oh, manager, trying to put it all together. Yeah. And there isn't really, there should be at the okay. Sure, they will inform that. It's the same people. Yeah, I'm sure they'll, it will inform both, but it's uh, specific for to the section that does the uh, inventory and assessment, and then the de development of or design of the statewide EMS system. So it's sort of that shattered way. So, like maybe for Representative Boyden, uh, the diagram of Richmond, and I know that Chippewa County has a very unified uh, EMS system. As I got out into the southern districts, 
found that it, it's more of a hybrid system. So my concern was always uh, how do we standardize training uh, and management? Some some of the EMS organizations down there are actually corporations. And I'm talking with, with municipalities, they struggle to get uh, qualified EMPs and uh, I'm just thinking that maybe this pot of money might be a way to bring everybody under the same envelope. Is there an effort to do that here? Yeah, I would say that there's definitely an effort within the EMS advisory committee to look into this, um, looking at um, a, a training facility possibly, um, what would that look like, or also um, mobile training. Okay, one more question. I just want to respond a little bit to Senator Gulick's question about the DevOps work on this. Last year, we did a deep dive into dispatch, which is different than EMS, but related. Um, dispatch is what calls EMS if necessary. Um, uh, but I will say that this situation about the differences in services and training and standards, et cetera, is very similar to the conversation about dispatch. And it's very similar to a lot of issues across the state. And it's one of the reasons why we, the GovOps committee did S-159, which is the county governance and regional governance study, because there are so many advisory committees and so many like, let's come up with a different way of governing X, Y, and Z, that there's no consistency across. And so I think public safety, broadly speaking, when it comes to EMF, dispatch, um, police services, fire, um, all of it could and should be better coordinated and consistent across our state and have the same government structure rather than let's come up with a different government structure for each kind of service. So to the extent that this bill would create a, a new different governing structure for EMS, I would have concerns about that um, because we don't need another different type of thing. It, it's already really confusing out in the field. Thank you. Good points. You're right. And so, and a lot of the EMS in the more rural parts of the state, uh, my, so my municipalities are all volunteers, can't corral them, how do you train them? It's a, it's a never, never ending issue or set of issues. And we did run into that a little bit with the bill that we passed um, recently. So we'll, so we'll come back, all we'll mixed up together. But it's good to have two committees looking at it because it will offer more improvements than otherwise, including the Medicaid reimbursement stuff and so forth. So Nolan, we have someone on Zoom and we have you. So we're going to do you want to go first? I should Drew? go first and then let yes. Drew fix all of my errors. And then Drew is going to take it over. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you for coming in this today. Thank, Thank you. See you all. record, so yeah, I think it makes sense for me to go for Drew and then Drew can answer all your questions yes. about how the money is spent, what's happening on the ground, um, if any of my mistakes. Um, I do this one note, so I'm on the web, still be on the website and you know, share my screen. There it is. There it is. Um, so, um, the bill, I'm going to talk mostly about the EMS special fund, but first I'll just talk about the AHS piece. And the bill would require uh, AHS to reimburse EMS providers for services provided to Medicaid beneficiaries. It could not result in a transport to different locations, uh, such as hospital, during a period of an emergency. The reimbursement would be at a rate equal to the Medicare basic life support rate. Um, it was estimated that would be about $74,000. Um, so the bill would bill appropriate $74,000 of which 31,206 general funds to AHS and DIVA to cover the estimated increase in reimbursements. I have a question um, and I think somebody can answer it, but when we have an emergency event, 
where we had need, because we ran into this with Irene where people were not getting their medications or, and getting to doctor's offices. Emergency transports get reimbursed by federal dollar, through federal dollars when they're, um, when we have a flood or other emergency. I, I would. Um, That's just a you, question I'm throwing out there. I would ask you to put in that question and ask Drew. Okay, I'll know the answer to that. Drew will have the answer. Where is all the answers? I got it. Okay. So the other piece that I want to talk about in the bill is the uh, the MS the Mercy Medical Services Fund. Um, currently, there is the EMS training fund. It, currently receives $150,000 a year. Um, the money is administered by the health department, uh, by the Division of Emergency Preparedness, Response, and Injury Prevention, for which I believe the um, deputy commissioner, I believe, is here. Uh, I used to be, not anymore. Oh. Uh, Do you want to introduce yourself? I'm sorry, I'm Dan Bates. I'm the deputy commissioner oh, of public safety. I've met you before, and yeah. I've never recognized you. I used to be the EMS chief, and after that, I was sure. the, the um, director of emergency preparedness, response, and prevention. Do you know the answer to my question about double dollars? I, I think I do, but I, I, I'd ask. Okay. So, are you talking about just from an interfacility standpoint, like we're going from one hospital to another, or any transport, any services offered? Yeah. During uh, an emergency response. Um, sorry. It's okay. Yeah. It, Don't need to answer. Yeah. We will. We'll get the answer, and any help you can provide at another time. I think I can, and I'll. Terrific. But, he was okay. trying to be incognito when I called him out. I know. It's okay. <laughs> um, so the money is administered by the health department. This $150,000 is actually part of a bigger pot of money. It comes from a $1.2 million collected each year from insurers for the Vermont Fire Services Training Council. So what happens is DFR collects fees, collects a fee from insurance companies that rate fire, homeowners, farm owners, auto, marine, commercial, et cetera. And they collect $1.2 million. And then 100,000 of that goes towards fire training and 150,000 of that goes to the EMS training fund. So that's kind of how it's done. Um, what the bill does is that it increases that 1.2 million to 1.5 million. And it takes that extra 300 and puts it to the EMS trace fund. Now, a little bit about that, how that works, is the way the DFR does is they currently how it's collected, is they look at all the different companies that write those premiums. They look at their share of premium total, which is about a billion dollars in premium. So they look at what each of those is paying, and then they they are charged a percentage based on their allocation of how much they're allocated. The fee based on their percentage of the market. So, for instance, there are about 297 companies that currently pay into this. The highest company, the most the company pays is 79,000. The lowest the company pays is 21 dollars. So you can see this rate again. That's not based on about a billion dollars. So what the bill does is that. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to highlight too is what Representative Boyd talked about is. So the fire service training fee was established in 1993. Um, it was last increased in 2016 from 950 to 1.2 million. The EMS training fund was created in 2011 with an allocation of $150,000 and has not been increased since it was created. Okay. So that's Representative Boyd was alluding to. So what the bill does is that there's $300,000 extra go to uh, the extra new 300,000 go to the MS training fund. So now there's 450. But what they did was one time they take 150 of that 300 and do it to, for, for the study, for the work, the implementation of the report is. And what is also in this in my fiscal note, um, So what they do is 150,000 from that of the 300, 150,000 would go to the EMS fund. Uh, 150,000 that would be to support the work of the EMS advisory committee that's set forth in the bill. And to the extent that there's an additional, any additional money left in the fund, up to $220,000 
could also be used. That comes, get, gets into the 370 that was initially, because originally I think there was $370,000 general fund appropriation. And given the budget constraints, what they said was, well, let's take half of the EMS, half of the 300. And to the extent that there's money available in the fund, an additional 220 mm -hmm. to get the 370 can be used for just one time to do that work. And the following year, all 300 would go for training. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I have. So we have the, we have this one out on our web page. Yeah. For a hard copy. Yeah. Okay. That answer. It'll get clearer and clearer as we go through the bill. Okay. No, it's not. That's good. I do want to hear from Drew. Okay. And we wanted to take a few minutes looking at our list of, um, budget suggestions. So Drew Hazelton is here. Ah, ready, ready to respond, or are you responding? Welcome. Thank you, um, and uh, sorry for the uh, the Zoom call. I normally like to be in the room with you. We're doing uh, swift water rescue training all week, getting ready for next summer's flooding. Um, so. I guess just a little um, little background. So Drew Hazelton, I'm the Chief of Operations at Rescue Inc. Um, I also chair the EMS Advisory Committee. I've been working in EMS in Vermont for 28 years. Um, most of that is paramedic out of the Brattleboro area. Uh, EMS in Vermont is is challenging. Uh, rural EMS is is complicated, and as you all know, it's delivered in many different ways um, across the state. Um, and that's not unique to Vermont. Um, rural EMS across the country is uh, delivered in a lot of different ways. Um, in Vermont, we have um, municipal services. We have you know, municipal standalone services. We have municipal fire-based EMS. We have uh, nonprofit. We have regional nonprofit services. And we have a couple of uh, for-profit EMS services in Vermont. And this is, I'm speaking mostly of ambulance services. They're part of a, a larger um, response uh, system. So we talk a lot about ambulance services, but we we don't talk a lot about um, our first response squads. So I think it's important to note that there are a lot of additional EMS responders that are local, community-based, that are the ones that are getting out uh, first to your house, providing CPR, stopping bleeding. And um, we've done a lot of work over the last few years at increasing that that workforce through uh, the Vermont uh, First Responder Program. So with what's happening in EMS, we're seeing a 20 to 30% staffing turnover year over year um, and a much higher demand on our uh, training resources. In the last um, few years, since uh, the year before COVID, we've come to the legislature and asked for additional education funding dollars those funding dollars have ranged from um, an additional half a million dollars to um, last year was a million dollars in education funding. With those funds, uh, we've been able to almost maintain our workforce. Um, we, if you look at the EMS advisory report, which was submitted to you guys uh, a few months ago, um, it's notable that even with the investment in education dollars, we're just barely treading water. Uh, the call volume for EMS, the demands on EMS are increasing. Um, we've got over 110,000 requests for service a year. And the workforce is um, at the same level or slightly lower than it was five years ago. So that kind of brings me to where we are in the bill. I'm grateful, as is the EMS community, that the legislature is taking up these conversations. Um, the investment in reimbursing for treatment without transportation um, is a huge step forward for us. About 30% of the calls in Vermont uh, do not result in transport and have historically um, led to just costs for service providers. Um, so having Medicaid um, reimbursed for those would be a step in the right direction. Our uh, congressional de delegation has a very similar bill 
that's been introduced in Washington that will hopefully get some traction and help us with Medicare. Um, from the EMS education perspective, uh, increasing the EMS education special fund um, to 450,000 is a step in the right direction. Um, based on the research from the advisory committee, uh, we need about $3 million a year um, to support the education needs of our EMS system in Vermont currently. Um, most of that additional funding is coming from uh, local budgets, municipal budgets, and as somebody already said, uh, in many rural communities, the first responders are paying for their own education. Um, with the current changes in education requirements, so nationwide, uh, EMS has updated its education requirements to um, portfolio and competency-based education. Um, it is becoming more expensive and um, more difficult to provide uh, access to education to uh, EMS providers around the state. So investing in that is certainly appreciated. Um, as the chair of the advisory committee, um, we've done a lot of good work. Uh, part of that led to the development of the Vermont first responder, as well as updating our instructor coordinator uh, positions in Vermont. We've already looked at this uh, bill and set a work plan to um, try to meet the um, requests of the legislature as far as uh, questions going to next year. And we're looking forward to digging into that work as soon as we're, uh, we're able. Uh, Drew, thank you very much. I, I know that you're in the middle of training, um, so it's good to see you in the process. Uh, and I, I just want to say, you know, thank you for your comments and also thank you for your work. Um, and the we had an outstanding person who was our chief, our fire chief, and in charge of EMS in Williston, and he took. He took it, took the whole program from the ground floor up. And some of you may know Ken Morton, and that's why I mentioned him. It's awesome. We work closely together. And so the point is to have the results that we see in some municipalities is sometimes on the shoulders of one person. So, and you're one of those people. So I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you. And I, I do have a question. I see that you indicated that federal requirements for education are increasing. Is it federal requirements that are going up? Where do the requirements come from? And then is there any, um, and what if any support gets to either the Department of Health or to, um, to responders? Yeah, so uh, the Education standards are are set uh, by the National Registry of, of EMTs. So it's a it's a professional organization that's setting the standards. It is, and and Vermont has adopted those standards, and that's what we all work um, by. And and as you know, part of it is the evolution of medicine. Um, EMS yes. twenty years ago was really about um, scooping people up and and getting them to the hospital. EMS of today is is very different. Um, so in our service in Brattleboro, um, we provide um, critical care transportation, um, critical care services. So in our ambulances, you're finding um, ultrasound, you're finding things that, you know, were never thought of before, where the assessment level with EKGs and high-level cardiac monitors and ventilators, IV pumps, it, it requires a different level of training and education than it ever has because the profession has become uh, more complicated than ever. Most people don't think about the part of EMS, which is moving patients from one critical access facility to, to a definitive care. And when you're in the hospital, you have a respiratory therapist, a nurse, and a doctor quite often all taking care of you at the same time. In order to get you to that cardiac care center, um, all of that care is gonna be turned over to a single paramedic and a six by nine metal box traveling down the interstate. And that's what the education standards um, are starting to reflect is the level of uh, education and professionalism that's needed to provide those services. And that requires some resources. We get it. Yes. Okay. 
Questions for Drew. Uh, Drew, we may invite you back again as we go through the bill. We'll, we'll take we, we will take a little time to look at the bill and then the bill uh, in terms of looking at how to coordinate systemically all these services across the state. Obviously, GovOps is going to be playing a role too. So we'll look at some of the educational issues and, and um, standards that you're talking about and uh, how perhaps we can engage hospitals or other clinicians in making connections. So thank you. Questions for Drew, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Hey, Drew, thank you so much uh, for your testimony and your work. And I just want to put a plug in since you're doing Swiss water rescue training. Um, we in the Government Operations Committee included $750,000 in our big bill, S310, for Swift Water Rescue, which includes paying for training. And um, I'm just putting a plug in here now, since the chair is on appropriations, um, that appropriations include that $750,000 in the big bill huh. so that Swift Water Rescue can also get training, statewide coordination, facilities, and equipment. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing like being lobbied by your No, we saw take the opportunity. It's important. You got it. Okay. Drew, so, any, any other questions? Any other comments? Yeah, so if, if we're taking opportunities, um, I would like to invite everybody <laughs> down to the EMS, uh, um, Vermont's only full-time EMS Academy, which is uh, in Southern Vermont. We oh. opened in uh, October of 2022. They're now providing uh, education across the state to help try to fill those gaps. So if you're looking for a field trip, uh, you can come down yeah. and see what it is that EMS does. We have high fidelity human simulation. Uh, we have an ambulance that actually is inside of the building, all pneumatically controlled for realistic uh, simulation. And you're welcome to join us anytime. Thank you for that invitation. Now, this committee missed a very important field trip in the in the middle of winter. Now you're opening up great possibilities. We could have a joint committee field trip with GovOps and Health and Welfare. That would be fun. That would be fun. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So we're going to move on. I know this is like peripatetic, but we're going to move on to another topic and we would say thank you to everyone who's here for 622. It's good, helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 You know, Amy's coming out of here. She didn't have another iteration. She, we talked about it in the past. Oh, yeah. Is anybody else know that? Drew? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we'll switch over. We're going to smoke in you. Well, it's a nice smoke. It's a hot one. We're going to smoke. Many guys, let's, let's, have a, let's have a short discussion. Um, we also have, yeah. the, today is a naturopathic physician day, and we're going to have them in, in a little while. But we have the list that Amy put together for us yesterday, which was a list of, you have this one, that's what we're working for. We're working from two things. We're working from this, and then we're working on a budget sheet that um, Amy Pope put together for us, this, that we got yesterday. This, this came from a joint fiscal audit. Do you have a copy of that? No. We need more copies of that. We have this on our web page. Yes, it's on our web page. And we also, that's the, um, this one. You got it. You got it. So we had, so there were some things, if you look at the bottom, starting with the, with the um, budget page that is, has green and yellow highlights on it. At the bottom, there were one-time appropriations that were um, requested. And then there are some other things there that were, that are not.
And then at the on the other page, just sort of remind yourself what's there. And on the other page, I think going through that well, what's here. I'm gonna say, let can we look at those that are blind on the right hand side? So are there a number of bills there that will be considered this one? Yeah, this yellow. Um yeah, I was trained right that center on the page. Is that now associated with page 622? Which one? Right in the middle of the page. Oh, yeah. Yes, it is. It's in the and it's, it's being considered in the budget, and it's something that we can recommend for consideration. And um that's age six twenty. That's six twenty two. So we do have that in six twenty two. I think the issue is that it was there was an initial ask of a million bucks. That was probably added was irrespective of six twenty two. What's the yeah. total amount? Well, no, I mean I think it's a separate ask. A separate separate. I, you know, I don't know what's there, not. but I, I don't know how was it. There was an ask, I think, earlier in the session of a million bucks. And this might have been before 622 kind of finalized. So I'm looking at, uh, here are the blank spaces that we're looking for. Um, I believe that the recovery residences you'll see are there with a request. And we do know that starting way down there, um, I have to start up by food bank request for $5 million. I'm skipping over the top where that begins with universal pay family leave and developmental disability housing. Skipping over that for the time being and moving down to food bank and beginning there and just going down the list of things that we could uh, prioritize as a primary. Um, and, and today we're just looking at those that we might prioritize I'd like each of you to think about which of these is critically important to you. And then tomorrow we're going to make a priority list. So food bank for $5 million. And I think there has been some discussion in the budget, but this is oh, a yeah. big ask. Okay. Uh, and we are behind. We will probably not be with you for another 15 yeah, we're on time. Um, food bank. Then uh, skipping over Meals on Wheels, which is in the budget and is, I think, being added in the budget. Uh, then we have the request by the federally qualified health centers who are cons concerned about increased reimbursement rates. Um, and Mary Kate Coleman, you're here. That request was related to just to fill it out for the committee. The rate request for by state for the um, sorry for the record, Mary Kate Molman by State Primary Care Association. Our request was for a total of two point eight million in state dollars. So there would obviously be the federal match to accompany that. Uh, it really comes down to an additional ask of one point eight million on top of what the governor included in his budget recommendation, which was I won't go into the details of it, but it was to annualize the rate that had been approved in the BAA. And the value of having that, that we need it. Um, we need that to um, provide the funding uh, to support DIVA as they work with FQHCs to bring their rates up to date. <laughs> There is a long, very long history. I can go into that, but no, that's okay. You just bring <laughs> the rates up to be, yeah. Okay. And I would also have we have um, reached a diva and by state and the equities have reached an uh, agreement on the key elements of our rate setting, and I included that uh, summary uh, and sent it to you and Kiki. Okay, this morning. We have it somewhere, so Kiki has it on the website. Uh, okay, then moving down to adult days. The adult days are, from what I understand, disappearing. Is there anyone here who can speak to adult days? No, it's okay. 
I know that they are in dire straits in terms of serving um, some of our oldest and easiest folks. And there's nothing in the, uh, the, the Appropriations Committee is talking about um, supporting them. Is there a, up near the top of the IDB, the adult children, could you jump over that? Which one? Uh, I, I dropped down from that. I, I I left all the over 10 million, over 7 million. I left all of those up above. Okay. I mean, they're not really good. Okay. Um, then skipping down, we, we in the bill. Recovery residences, as I said, that is in the budget. So I think we can, we do value our recovery residences. I don't know if anybody else has been thinking about this, but I'm just going through. Um, EMS training, we just heard about. Meals on Wheels is in the budget. It will, it is going to be, there will be some funding for that, from what I understand. Then there are parent child centers. Which is not funded in the budget, just left out. And I, um, Amy, you're here. You can speak to that. Yes. Yeah, um, Amy Schollenberger, uh, lobbyist for Parent Child Center Network. Um, the PCCs this year have a base funding request that's related to two things. One is the statute update that you all passed a few years ago. Um, has the grant running through the network and they've been working with the department to meet all the requirements necessary to make that happen. So that will start happening this year. And um, so some of the increases just around that process, about half, they're asking for about $721,000, about half of it goes to meeting those statutory requirements. And the other half is related to the 12% increase in healthcare costs. Last year, you were very supportive of them increasing salaries and benefits for their staff to reduce turnover. That's had a huge impact. But as soon as they implemented those uh, benefit increases, they were hit with a 12% increase in health care, just like everyone else in the state. And so ha about half of the request goes to that just to keep those benefits intact because they are, for many staff, new benefits. Yeah. So basically, the seven hundred twenty-one thousand, that more or less, it's here, is related to the um, work that we did last year. Yeah. Past few years, actually. Yeah. yeah. This committee has been critical to bringing the network okay. um, to partnership level with the state. But okay. All right. Skipping over its background because it's in the bill. And then the next one I think is related to um, what we just heard um, from you, FQHCs and so community health centers. So that's a five hundred thousand dollar. That's different. But that, that? I don't know. That ain't different. I'm not sure what. Because that's different. But I'm not sure what for. What is H eight eighty three again? For the budget. That's the budget. Oh, the... <laughs> okay, I know it's. <laughs> I think it's on here a bunch of times. Which bill is yeah, that? That's a big bill. <laughs> yeah, so because it comes over from the house and the bill, we don't guard it. We don't evaluate it. We well, the, the appropriations committee has it, and I can tell you that the things that are come over are being considered and funded one one level or another. I think for us, we want to look at the things that have been left out at this point. And if there are things that you feel passionate about after that, we'll go back and reinforce what's in the budget. It's being, a lot of these I things are being- thought the exercise would be what we would prioritize given- We can. We can at the end. I'm just looking at the things right now that are not in the budget. No, I hear that. I understand there are ways that might already be in there that I mean prioritize lower than what yeah. hasn't been funded. Exactly. Yes. Um, I don't know, I can't tell you what the early childhood local school monies are for. 
um, dementia respite is some of the work that we've been doing on Alzheimer's. Um, and then the recovery residents will skip over that. That's in the bill. Could be a priority. Could be both. Same with post so Then there is um, the SASH model community health approach to homelessness. You want to talk about that one? The the SASH, SASH, and then SASH overall, I think, is <laughs> missing you know, budget. Maybe the budget. Oh. Uh, for the record, uh, Molly Dugan with Cathedral Square. We're also the statewide administrator for the SASH support services at home model. And the specific request we're looking for the Senate to add into its version of the budget is a $300,000 request for the SASH for all pilot model that's in its second year of operation right now. We all supported it last year with an appropriation of $450,000 to continue it. In its second year, um, we're able to lower our request this year because we've got m t Bank to invest in the pilot over the next three years at $150,000 a year. Um, so we have some leveraged uh, private dollars and we are also, the uh, we've also just Monday put in a request for a freshman directive spending allocation to cover um, the year after this one. So we're, we're trying to move away from state appropriations, but this is the real lifeline to keep this really successful pilot going. We've seen incredible impacts after a year and a half, increased housing stability, lower emergency room visits for our participants, um, really seeing the same kind of success we saw in the traditional SASH. So that's the 300000 that we're looking for the Senate. Um, you know, hopefully you guys can recommend to include in the budget this year. Do you know why the House didn't put it in? Um, we worked very diligently to get it in there. My sense is that because um, the House side had uh, some infrastructure around a resident services fund, uh, a state funded resident services fund to happen, that the idea was it could go there. But I think that that was a, it was a $6 million request, which was really large given all the priorities. So we've always wanted to have a this kind of plan B is that resident services fund didn't materialize. So is that that's a long-term care crisis, crisis for care enhanced residential rate study? No. That's different. It's different. It's different. No, I'm very interested. I don't in see both, it on my list. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if so if you have been involved in visiting and looking at SASH pilot is or the model is, but for me this one did you did you send us I can follow up and send you all our latest data. Absolutely. Yeah that'd be great. Yeah. So what did what did you say? Sure. For you this one I didn't hear your last word. I said it's important for me. Yeah one. I mean Sash was a proven model. Yes. These are all improved. All right. Um so are you doing something tomorrow on this? Well, yes, we are. Tomorrow since... we're going to, tomorrow, what I would like for you to do is to listen, look at what we have on our web page, and I'm sure people will be addressing you in the hallways and every other place, <laughs> and then we'll come back tomorrow and we'll bring a, bring a list, and bring a list with those things, everything that's here, are your priorities, and the things that you want to move down on the list, the things you want to move up on the list, so... Uh, this is not the best way to do this, but it's what we have. Um, and I know that, you know, I, I just look at all the important things here, parent child centers. Okay, okay. so then um, the statutory nurse increase. Um, I think that goes into more of some policy issues. Yeah, let's hold that thought. And uh, move on to um, what are we missing here? Increases in um, reimbursement rates for our care partners, our DAs, and our SSAs. Um, what else are we missing? It's not here. We have the food bank. We have. I mean, all of our 
the bills. All of our bills. So we, that, my yeah. suggestion is to put our bills up on top, that we pass these bills, and, and because we pass them, uh, or we are passing them, yeah. we see them as priorities there. And then the next step is, yes, Yes. The other thing, for the record, no language was disclosed. The other thing the committee could do on their off time would be to look at the health care committee and the human service committee recommendation documents that they provided to appropriation. Um, I can send Kiki, but those probably Please. have other things that were not. This is all, remember, this is just the public hearing stuff. Yes. They heard testimony. Also, and right. things that are not on the public hearing sheet that may be in their priority list, just to give you a sense of what other asks mm -hmm. are out there. If that's what you're trying to get a grasp of. So, goals. Kiki, can you get those and put those on our web page? I'll send them to you. The, the key hard to find. I'll find yeah. What else is missing? I'm looking around the room. So, the second sheet. Yes. It has the items in the bottom. Several of those are on here, but several of them. Some of them are not. Exactly. Um, what's, the, what's the second sheet? That is the one that um, Amy Pope handed out to us yesterday. The things that are in the budget or budget were in the budget somewhere. From 24. This is from 2024. This is not extra yes. years. So these are the things that might would be of interest to us. One time appropriations. So one time appropriations from last year, for example, the SAG, the SAG pilot extension was funded last year for four hundred fifty thousand dollars. This year, it wasn't included in the budget as it came over from the house, and the ask was and is. Three hundred thousand dollars. So, just as you compare these two, what you have on the more colorful sheet is last year's budget. Make it simple. And then we've had some other things that are one-time asks, uh, like uh, empty arms. And well, that were list of things. I have all the that people have sent to us or us in the Google uh, post permanency program by John. Um, the food bank, which I think we've all received in our hands. Um, the care partners request for increased reimbursement. Um, so we've received a lot of information. So the other one is um, the other thing that we we're, we're, you may not be aware of is how money gets moved in for primary prevention and into the prevention fund from the cannabis excise tax. And right now, legislation says that up to ten million dollars will be put will be provided for for prevention. But there isn't a separate fund for that. So the money can go somewhere and not be held. We don't have cost accounting of it. So I would like this committee to think about maybe what we should be doing is recommend a fund and have the <clears throat> have the um, cannabis money, tax tax money that is targeted for uh, prevention go into a separate fund. So add that one to your thinking. If you will, I have it in my thoughts. Because we have talked about it a little bit in appropriations, and I thought, well, it's good. we should be talking about it here. We can't talk about everything, but something. So is there anything else that I that you folks who are sitting in the room, I know you're here, you have specific interests, you have a specific thing that's on the list that has well, I, I think we're certainly watching uh, uh, Beverly Bogat, Vermont Early Childhood Advocacy Alliance, for the record. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we're, in, we're interested certainly in empty arms. It's a perinatal loss program. It's a relatively small ask of $40,000. Yes. Um, it, it 
really important. One time. One time, thank you. Um, it's really meant to help empty arms get that program up and running um, yes. so that they uh, can, you know, the volunteer driven um, program to support families who have experienced the loss of a child, um, you know, during uh, birth or thereafter. Um, very important uh, model, and we'd like to really be able to make sure that can continue. Um, and the other uh, piece would, it would be just the two one is two one <laughs> appropriate to bring up at this time. I don't know. I don't see it on your list, but just know that we're um, right now two one one is in the budget for um, continuing its current service hours, which end at um, eight p.m. Uh, wait, uh, or eleven. Mm -hmm. So you want to pick that up? Amy Schallenberger, for the record. Um, several of my clients care about 211. Um, right now, the service hours are oh, 8 a.m. Yeah, to 11 p.m. Yeah. The request is for 332000 to bring it back to 24 7. That is included in the house budget as a one time of over age. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. One last thing. Thank you. Because we have some naturopathic. Naturopathic. Amy Johnson, Vermont Care Partners. You'll see at the top of your um, public hearing list the $14.6 million for DAs and SSAs. That's 6.5 percent rate increase that I know many of my members have been talking to about. The other um, part of our ask is $444,000 for elder care. That's our homebound older Vermonters who have co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders, um, a really critical program for an aging state that has not seen an increase in 24 years since its inception. We don't have that on our it's list. It's on the second, it's not on that list. No, I don't know I why, because somebody did testify in the public hearing, but on my one pager that I sent you, it is on there. And Kiki has that. So, and maybe many of you do in the yeah. room, so. Yeah. All right, all the things people have sent us. <laughs> I'll send it again. We get all these <laughs> sheets and I, I save them, but you know, Mine's the colorful it's green and blue enough. one. Is it this one? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so let's let's do this. Let's let's bring us back to this tomorrow in earnest, and we'll try to put together a, a list of recommendations that we can agree with um, as a committee. And I'm so. If you have some ideas ahead of time, send them, send them to me and copy um, Jen and Nolan. And that way we'll have we'll begin to see what looks good. Are you speaking to your committee members? I'm speaking to my committee members. Okay. There's nobody else at the table. Ms. Harris. Just make so sure. If you have priorities. And you can copy everybody on the committee. We don't lose it. I don't. What I don't want to do is start a conversation out no. in the Ethernet. We do want to get a sense of what people are looking at, and that will give us a, a chance to consider what. Wait, you want us to email you them in advance? I'm sorry. If you have anything in advance, oh, and you have a little list and you'd like to share, then you can send it ahead. Of you. And if and you got, we can just argue tomorrow. And we can meet tomorrow. Problem. I'm going to try and put together something. Okay, so that's good. And we have a little bit of time left, and I know that Heather, you're here. Our time got. And there's two got people in the waiting room. Oh, they're out. Oh, they're in the waiting room. There we go. Cool. Good. Anything else? Okay. And I understand that. Uh, I can do that. Okay, I understand that. <laughs> The nat naturopathics, um, our naturopaths are meeting with the Department of Health on Monday. Yes. Talk about that too. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you both for being here. Welcome. Thank, thank you. Wait, wait, oh. hold it. Time out. Something oh. is on. It shouldn't be. Um, we're going to have the committee introduce going to introduce ourselves to you and then have you introduce yourselves and just share a little bit. Uh, so I'm Senator Jenny Lyons from Chittenden Southeast. I'm Senator Martine LaRock Ulick from Chittenden Central, live in Burlington. Hello. Good morning, Dave Weeks representing Roman County. Senator Terry Williams representing Walton County also. 
<clears throat> Hi again, I'm Senator Ruth Hardy. I met you last week from Addison District. Okay, so welcome. Um, Dr. Stephen Moore, why don't you go first? Absolutely. Uh, again, for the record, uh, Dr. Stephen Moore, uh, practicing naturopathic physician in Brattleboro, Vermont. I'm the legislative chair for the Vermont Association of Naturopathic Physicians, or VANP. And uh, thank you again for allowing me to come back. Uh, I know we, we had an introduction weeks back. And um, the, as Senator Hardy mentioned, uh, we, we met uh, in last week's testimony in uh, GovOps. Um, I had last night submitted uh, uh, written testimony to this committee, and also um, I'm happy to provide an oral specifically around H870 and our, our current legislative asks. And I'll, I'll lead with the, the kind of the, the common theme behind the, the three major asks, and to remind everybody and, and state for the record, those those asks legislatively are the ability uh, to sign death certificates and have those be recognized the ability to create clinician orders for life-sustaining treatment or COLS, as it's known in Vermont, and, and do not resuscitate orders, uh, as well as inclusion in Act 39, medical aid and dying. The theme behind all three of those really is uh, to, to align ourselves with our, the recognition, our recognition in the state of Vermont as primary care providers, so that already exists, and, and to further be able to service our patients, expand in the state of Vermont, uh, those primary care services to those patients in need, and really continue collaborating with our, our colleagues, which we argue are right, our medical doctors, doctors of osteopathy, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants, which I understand also uh, can hold that designation as primary care provider. A lot of this started uh, around the um, uh, recognition by one of our, our members, our physician members who was having an issue, uh, having a death certificate that he was asked to fill out being, being not recognized by the Department of Health. That put that family uh, uh, sort of in a precarious situation. Looking through that, why that would have arose, really centered around the fact that uh, our inclusion as primary care providers didn't happen until around 2012. The, the wording regarding the, um, the, the definition of healthcare provider as it relates to statutes centered around death certificates mm -hmm. was generated in 2009. But then, um, as I'm sure you guys will have already know or will see in our written testimony, there was movement of that definition amongst different statutes after the fact uh, in 2017 but it didn't, it didn't chip us off in any way. And looking back at written testimony and recorded oral testimony in 2017, that movement did not, it wasn't recorded. Like we didn't, we didn't see any conversation regarding it or testimony. So it evaded us. The other thing, which I just want to highlight, which I did not last week is uh, specifically, if I may, in 26 VSA 4124, the wording is naturopathic physicians are subject to the provisions of the law relating to contagious and infectious diseases and to the issuance of birth and death certificates. And that was last updated in 2002. Now, when I, I read that, and a lot of my colleagues read that, um, we're, we, there's some assumptions that are made. All of that to say, it's sort of, a, fell off our radar. And my colleague, Dr. Sam Russo in 2021, uh, I believe, had provided oral testimony in uh, Senate uh, Committee on Government Operations as well, where it was just kind of left. And so picking back up um, and taking a look at where else in the statute might there be some uh, oversight or really just a revision to the, uh, to the statute that allows us a seat at the primary care table, so to speak, that's where these other asks or priorities, as I'll call them, came in. Again, regarding the generation and creation of COLST, DNR, and inclusion in Act 39. I'll also say this as it relates to death certificates. Other states in, in our country allow, uh, allow for this. Specifically, Arizona 
California, Hawaii, Oregon, and Washington. So there is a precedent. The other piece to this is death certificates. A, a large and growing number of individuals are, are passing away outside of hospice, outside of the hospital, uh, in, in their homes. And it, my understanding, the last uh, provider in contact with that patient oftentimes is either asked to provide uh, 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 the death certificate or is interviewed. I would imagine that would relieve some undue burden already on the system if we were allowed us, uh, inclusion there. As it relates to DNR and COLSTs, Arizona and Oregon currently already allow for this. Uh, if, we're, if we're talking about our interactions with patients, oftentimes already talking about advanced directives with my patients. I spend many years getting to know them. And, and quite honestly, uh, you know, uh, per the patient's wish, wish to be able to generate a do not resuscitate order, which directs right EMS care or the hospital, I would imagine it's not a stretch to be able to do so and honor our patient's wishes. And cost agreements, not to go uh, through those in, in, in a super great detail at this point out of respect of everybody's time, you can imagine a cost is really a treatment plan, which we generate commonly every day. So to be able, the ability to work with and collaborate with our patient to be able to generate something that's recognized to guide other providers in collaboration makes total sense to me. Uh, lastly, Dr. Moore, um, and I hesitate to interrupt you, but I would like to, uh, we also have, we have so little time this morning. It would be helpful if we could hear uh, briefly from Dr. Yanis. And um, I know that you are intricately involved in the process now to uh, change the language, the legislative language that allows for you to do those three things. And I know you'll be speaking with GovOps and perhaps again in this committee. So can we move to Dr. Uh, Yanitz at this time? Absolutely. Don't even have to ask uh, me. <laughs> thank you. I, I do appreciate your time and your um, information very much. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, I'll take that as my cue to start. Dr. Joanne Yanez, for the record, Executive Director for the Association of Accredited Naturopathic Medical Colleges. We are the member organization for accredited programs of naturopathic medicine as recognized by the United States Department of Education. Uh, and the Council on Naturopathic Medical Education, which is the only accrediting body for uh, recognizing programs that lead to doctorates in naturopathic medicine. Uh, I've been asked here to speak to the education of naturopathic physicians, and uh, more importantly, really to just support what is a modernization of law here and, and how Dr. Moore uh, very nicely summarized what what is really just a modernization and inclusion and recognition of, of naturopathic doctors in the state of Vermont as they currently practice uh, as primary care doctors for their patients. And, uh, you know, this to me just feels like a common sense continuity of care for patients uh, that is supported by the primary care education that NDs receive. Uh, NDs are trained as primary care physicians, cradle to grave, literally. And this legislation very much supports that cradle to grave uh, type of care that naturopathic doctors do provide. And so in the education, it is four years of naturopathic medical education, as I stated, after a bachelor's degree, uh, after prerequisites required for, for medical education. The first two years are all of the biomedical foundational sciences, and then NDs move into clinical education, which covers really everything from, uh, from primary care, foundational care, general screenings, health screenings, to, geri to geriatrics, and to everything in between. And so uh, really all that I believe is being asked here is just for this common sense modernization to allow for patients to have continuity so that if, uh, you know, if an ND has been their primary source of medical care throughout the greater course of their life, as they reach different life stages, they can continue to have that care with their primary care doctor who may be a naturopathic doctor. And, and that's really all that is is on the table, I think, at this point. So thank you. And I'll yield my time to questions. Thank you so much. That was very clear, concise, and I appreciate that. And both of you uh, for being available today and being patient with our schedule. Um, it's greatly appreciated.
And I think <clears throat> you'll probably be back at some point, whether it's this committee or uh, in the Government Operations Committee, hopefully to finalize the discussion on um, your ask. Well, thank you. Well, we're going to call it a wrap for today, and 